you are listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out about more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is Peter Bedard. Peter is the founder of Convergence Healing and owner of Convergence Healing Teas. You can find out more about Peter Bedard and his wonderful work at his websites, convergencehealing.com and convergencehealingteas.com. Welcome, Peter Bedard. Hi, it's great to be back on your show. Thank you so much. So we're gonna be talking today about what the messages are behind our pain. And in one of my books, The Difference Between Pain and Suffering, one of my eight Amazon number one bestsellers, I talk about how there's a difference between the physical experience, which is pain, as they say, pain is inevitable, suffering is uh, optional, and then there's all these emotions, right, behind our pain. So Peter Bedard, pain first knocks quietly, then hits us over the head. How can we avoid this? Yeah. yeah, that's actually something I say quite often. You know, it comes in and it, and we hear that voice. You know, it's very quiet. It's very gentle, even at some time, and it just knocks quietly and says, hey, you might want to deal with this. And we go, oh, gosh, I don't have time for that, or I can't, or I don't know what to do with it, or, you know, it's too much, or it's too hard, or whatever it is. And then it comes back, and it really hits us over the head with the two by four. And that's actually a quote from one of my clients that taught me these lessons, you know, that, that her pain was hitting her over the head with a two by four, asking her to wake up. So I look at pain similar to you, where there, any wound has a physical side to it, a mental side to it, and a spiritual side to it. And so what we have to do, unfortunately, most of us are only working on one component of that. Like, I know you're a big component for, or a big advocate for understanding know how your pain is showing up in the body and what that actually means like what's the issue that maybe is the the emotional issue in beneath that and there's also a spiritual issue there's a mental issue when i get my football player coming in and he broke his knee yeah that's the doctors are doing a great job normally on helping that knee come back together and heal but they're not working on his heart and his heart is breaking you know his heart is the, the playing ball has been his favorite thing. It's been what he knows how to do. It's how he identifies himself. It's no, it's his passion. It's his love. And and then his mind is in a panic because maybe he doesn't know what he's going to get with his contract, contract or you know that fourteen million dollar house that he just bought. So how is it going to pay with it, right? So there's these levels of pain, and the pain is knocking at our door saying you need to address these issues. Most of the time, we're not paying to it, and so it has to knock louder and louder, and hence the two by four. One of the things we can do is actually learn to listen to the pain. And that's one of the reasons why I like your work so much, because our work is actually very similar. I teach people through meditative practice and a hypnosis and um, mindfulness and, and a visioning and stuff of that sort to actually talk to their pain and ask their pain what it needs in order for it to heal as if the pain was like a 17 year old rebel that everybody's wagging their finger at, right? Telling them how to fix the problem, but nobody's brought, nobody's spending the time to go to the rebel and ask the rebel, ask the kid, what the kid actually needs in order to get better. So part of my work is teaching a process so people can listen to ask the parts of their bodies what that part needs in order to heal. And not just the body, it might be their heart, you might have to ask the heart what it needs because your heart, their heart is broken. It might be an addiction issue. It might be an anxiety issue. There's a lot of different things that we need to start talking to and opening up that conversation. So to answer your question initially, you know, one of the ways that we can actually start listening and learning from our pain is to actually just be still. And allow, I like to invite people to personify the pain so whether again, whether it's mental pain or physical pain or spiritual pain, to take a moment and invite that part of us to step out of us 
to sit across from us, right? That have a seat on the couch and say, and to understand what it looks like. Something wonderful happens to the brain when we can personify something. I think it's why we personify lots of things, right? When we can actually give it a shape and a form of some sort and allow it to sit across from us, then our brain can kind of kick in instead of being overwhelmed and shutting down by the experience, which happens a lot with pain, the person can actually see and, and understand. It's like, oh, there, Bob just walked in the door. You know, that anxiety, that craving for something that just walked in the door. There's Bob. All right, Bob, you're showing up for a reason. What do you need? Right. And actually to start a conversation with Bob that actually empowers the person to create a roadmap for their healing because Bob's going to lead the way, you know? And so this is a really important thing to be able to stop, to be able to listen and stop medicating, right? We medicate so much. I know you're familiar with that with your clients in your life, right? We medicate with all of these things, whether it's, you know, a broken heart and we just go and meet up with other people or whether it's an anxiety that we're just shipping down and we're taking medications to not feel or whether it's, you know, an actual physical pain in our bodies that we just want to cut out and throw away. So I also advocate for love. And one of the things, we have a relationship with these parts of us, right? You know, we, we even talk about it. Like I remember there was a big thing years ago about women in thunder thought. And, and, and women were hating their bodies, and it's gotten worse. I think you know, men are doing these things now, too. Children are doing these things. And they're objectifying a part of their body, so, and, then, and then they're going to that part, and they're hating on it. They're, they're saying, they're talking to this part of themselves. And I don't want to direct this to you, so I'm going to go over to the side, right? But they'll say things to this part of themselves, and they'll say, I hate you, and I can't stand you. I'm ashamed of you. I'm embarrassed of you. I wish you'd go away. I want to cut you out. I want to throw you away. I want to drug you. I want to eliminate you, right? And if you were that part of me, right, you were a part of my body, my thighs, you know, or my shoulders or something like that. If I spoke to you that way, Catherine, how would you feel? Just terrible. Yeah. Exactly. And we talk to these parts of us and, you know, these parts are, are, like invisible friends, you know, like in the movie, right? there's the invisible friend. And that part is that it's always there. Nobody else can necessarily see it unless you have a talent like a medical intuitive, <laughs> right? And that part's always there. It's with us 24 seven and it, it, it can't go away. And so if we start talking to these parts so cruelly and abusively, then I don't know if they're anything like me, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to use, you do that to me and I'm going to react. And I'm not going to react in a good way. Right. I'm going to be... mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that we know is that your body believes everything that you say, right? Exactly. So if you say, you know, you're this fat, ugly slob, cancel, cancel, you know, or you're old, right? Or you're over the hill, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're, you're just too achy to exercise there are all these negative messages right mm -hmm. it's your body's mm -hmm. believing that now similar to peter bedard the way i look at the body as a medical intuitive healer is you've got a physical body you know what that is you have an energy system which includes your chakras the breath the acupuncture system the emotional body which is the largest part of anything emotions can shut down anything and it's my experience that when people are going to resolve their pain, unless and until they identify and clear the emotions at the same time, the energy just morphs, you know, just goes somewhere else, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you have your mind, which are your thoughts and beliefs, right? Which are so powerful. And then you have a soul, which is who you are. Now, the way I look at things is your spiritual body controls your mind. And one of the things we know is your mind controls your emotions. So this morning I was doing a medical intuitive reading on somebody who's having panic attacks. And I said, you know, you really need to come up with a different philosophy of life. You need to sit down with yourself and decide whether or not the universe is a friendly place. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. what the Einstein said. That was the most important question. So your soul controls your mind, your mind controls your emotions, your emotions control your energy. So if you're exhausted all the time, 
then there's something going on spiritually, mentally, or emotionally. And finally, all that affects your physical, right? So by the time that you're experiencing an ache in your body, right? Um, it, it's, it's been in your energy field, in your soul, in your mind, in your emotions, and in your energy system for some time, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's why I love energy workers. And most people don't, don't take that in account. And why I'm always talking about the pain is on these different levels. Because you may not be feeling it yet in your body, but it's still influencing maybe your mood or your, your as you walk through time and space, how you carry yourself. So right. to pluck out that stuff and go to the energy healers is just, I think it's a necessary part of, of the healing process. Right. Also, there's a flow of energy in the body, and it's really important to understand how energy flows. So I'm going to give a detailed explanation, because if you don't understand how energy flows, you can be working on the wrong thing. or you're A lot of people get frustrated with their pain because they're not working at it at the root source. So at any rate, you have what's called a horror line. The horror line is a vertical electrical current. It goes from above you, through you, all the way down into the earth. Mm -hmm. Now your Hara line feeds your chakras and the chakras are major energy vortexes in the body. A lot of people have heard about their seven chakras, but there's a lot more than that. Now the mm -hmm. chakras feed your acupuncture meridians, which is why acupuncture and acupressure and energy work like Reiki is so powerful. And then the acupuncture meridians actually feed the organs, and then the organs feel, feed the muscles. So by the time you have a cramp in your hamstrings or your calves, it's been, you know, this, this imbalance has been channeling through you for some time, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, and, you know, in this country, the reason that I wrote The Difference Between Pain and Suffering is that the leading cause of death in the United States for mm -hmm. Americans under the age of 50 is now actually drug overdose. So we're simply drugging the pain, right? Rather than working at the pain at the root source. Even yeah. just yesterday, I did a medical intuitive reading with somebody who had digestive problems. And I said to her, the root cause for her, this is in her case, was actually unresolved infections in her mouth and in her gums, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to get to the source of the pain, whether that's physical, right? Because in her case, she had chronic unresolved infections and or emotional, right? Which in her case was grief. Now, Peter Bedard, the founder of Convergence Healing, what does it mean to befriend my pain? So that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning. It's this idea of when the pain walks in the room, when you feel it, when you become conscious of it, instead of taking the attitude toward, oh, it's there again, I got to reach for my, my medication, or I got to go, whether, you know, if it's pain in the heart, and I'm going to go eat that chocolate cake, okay? Whatever it is that you're reaching for, instead of doing that, it's saying, I'm so sorry you're suffering. Mm. Going directly to that part that's showing up. That's why it can really help when that part has a shape or a form, and you give it a name like Bob or whatever, right? Bob just walked in the room. There's Bob. Bob is a beaten up heart, let's say. Mm -hmm. Bob is, instead of this, you know, this beautifully formed heart, Bob's got a dent in his side or something like that, you know? And to go to Bob and say, Bob, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you're suffering. Because I get it, man. I can feel it too. I'm so sorry you're suffering. Right? I do this a lot with my addiction and cancer clients. It's interesting how they parallel each other. So, I'll go to them and, and I'll invite them to say that. Right? I'm so sorry you're suffering. Thank you for still working for me. I once had a can I, I literally once had a heart patient come to me and he, he was angry at his heart because his heart wasn't working at full capacity. And I said, what if you had compassion and kindness and gratitude for your heart that it's actually still working and it's still doing its job and it's doing the best it can under the circumstances? What would it be like to actually say thank you? I'm so grateful you're still beating, right? I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. I'm so sorry you're suffering. And then I started doing this before, but I found out that, you know, the Hawaiian kahuna practice of ho'opono'ono, right? Of thank you. I'm so sorry. 
forgive me if I have contributed to your pain. Forgive me for not understanding that I, what I was doing was causing so much harm. I wasn't aware. I'm sorry. Or if I've done it and I was aware, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And that's the love part. That's where that love part comes in. And I like to ask people, I like to say, well, you know, when I, we talked earlier about how I, I said those horrible things, not just to you, but to that part, right? I hate you. I can't stand you. And how we respond to that. Well, I know that when I feel loved, I can do anything. So I wonder what it would be like. And I think this is a universal human truth. What would it be like if we actually allowed the part of us that's suffering to feel deep, deep levels of love? Mm. Right? I wonder if that part felt so cared for, so nurtured, so taken care, cared of, so full. I wonder what that part could do in its healing process if it felt so much love. And I look at this as a global level too. You know, when the pain comes and it knocks and it does it individually, it knocks on the door and it says, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? And we normally ignore it, right? And then it comes back and it knocks a little harder and then it knocks with that two by four. And I think that this is something that we need to look at on an individual level, but we also need to look at on a societal level, like cultural level. There is this pandemic and there's lots of other things that have been going on. And I look at that as that two by four, that two by four that's coming in and saying, bam, what are you guys going to do now? <laughs> right? How you've been doing things hasn't been working. So instead of being angry, which is what most of us are going into, instead of being angry and frustrated and attacking other people and stuff like that, what would happen if we actually brought even a deeper level of love to the parts of us if we're talking culturally, like the parts of our culture who have been suffering. <clears throat> and so what if we empower those parts, sat down and talked to those parts, asked those parts what they need in order to heal, right? And provided that to them. The same with the earth. What if we actually went to the earth and said, Mother Nature, we've been kind of, we've been abusing you. We've not been taking care of you. We love you. What can we do? to allow you to heal, right? This simple process is so applicable for so many things. And I, I mean, I'm just gonna show my book cover because <clears throat> you know, this is, I Catherine, I'm not as prolific in you as about trying. <laughs> I got four books now, but this is my first book and it's a bestseller as well. And this book, it really outlines those processes. So if anybody wants it, they can get it. As an audio version, they can get it as a as a paperback. You know, they can get it all uh, digital. But it, it, the process is so there, and it's so simple, so right? And, that, and the title of that book again for our audience is Convergence Healing: Healing Pain with Energetic Love. Convergence Healing is my brand, and you know, people can connect with me all over the place just by typing in Convergence Healing. But I, I love that I, you've connected with me and I love that I get to connect with so many people because I think we are the harbingers. We are the wayfarers. You know, we are, we are waving those flags. We're the canary in the coal mine and we're saying, come on people, we got to love more. We got to love ourselves more and we have to do that deeply, but we also have to love each other and we have to love our planet. I just wonder if, you know, one little act every day, I, I have a little uh, group that I created totally for selfish reasons, but I love to invite people to it. And I call it Cultivating Joy, which is the, uh, the copy of my, or the name of my third book. And Cultivating Joy is a group on Facebook. And every day I ask people, what can they do today to cultivate more joy in their life? Not happiness, because I look at happiness and joy as slightly different, right? Happiness is something that's conditional, it's wonderful. Happiness is when somebody says, Catherine, you look really cute today. By the way, is what I was thinking. I didn't get to say it when we started because we had so many other things, right? You know, oh my God, that feels so great, but it's conditional, right? It's that raise or, or something like that, right? Joy is that inner quality that is always there. I've seen joy show up and reveal itself in the most desperate and painful of situations. Joy is like an um, umbrella emotion, an experience that is always present. It's like a divine spark 
that is within each and every human being. So how are you going to cultivate joy today? And by doing that, maybe, just maybe, we can allow the world to grow and heal. And we can start those conversations, you know, with those parts and bring joy to those parts that are suffering, right? Bring joy to that anxiety. Gosh, I wonder right now, that sounds like a little weird in the brain. Like if you actually brought some joy to your anxiety or that addiction issue, how, how do you think it would respond? Would it get better or would it get worse? What do you notice? Right. Now, one of the things that we know it for a fact is that unresolved emotions show up in the body in terms of physical pain. And Sigmund Freud had some quote, I'm going to butcher it, but it says something to the effect of unresolved emotion, buried emotions never die, they show up in uglier ways, right? So mm -hmm. one thing's for a fact that if you've got an ache or pain, then, you know, one of the things you want to ask is what is the emotion that, what is the unresolved emotion behind the pain? And when I'm doing my readings, I read what's going on, physical, energetic, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And then I go through what I see will work on the physical level, you know, turmeric, tea, you know, massage, what have you, more rest, whatever. Um, <laughs> on the energetic level, emotional, mental, and spiritual. But again, if you, it's so crucial to understand this quote from Sigmund Freud that who's been around for a while, he's dead now, of course, but his thoughts are influencing us to this day is you have to identify that emotion and actually resolve it because otherwise you fix your elbow, it goes to your hip and you fix your elbow and hip and then it goes someplace else, right? We talk about that a lot in the addiction world, right? So you stop using the alcohol, the drugs or whatever, and then you go to sex or then you go to food or you go to cigarettes or you go to a lesser drug or whatever it is and you're just supplanting and still continuing to medicate. So I see that with my cancer clients. It's remarkable how almost every issue of cancer has been an unresolved, deep emotional experience. I and agree. there was abuse that maybe was done or a lot of grief in my experience shows up with cancer. A lot of unexpressed grief. So allowing ourselves to be present with these emotions and, you know, as a culture, we are so taught not to have our emotions. You know, there's certain emotions that we are allowed to express and we can express as big as we want. And then there's other emotions that you're not allowed to. And then it depends on your gender, right? Uh, I can't tell you how many women I've, been, I've worked with who have had breast cancer who were never told, who were never allowed to be angry. <laughs> you know, there's such a commonality I see in all my clients that, you know, and that they were always told they have to be, you know, this perfect way or this perfect experience and they weren't allowed to have their emotions and they weren't allowed to have anger and anger was ugly. So of course you never wanted to be ugly. So then you could never have anger and it is just exhausting. And to allow ourselves to actually have all of our emotions. So, you know, there's a, I, I mentioned it just briefly earlier, like there is a spectrum of human emotion and I believe joy is that umbrella that's over them. And joy is always attainable in even in the the saddest of times. I know I've been at funerals and been laughing my head off. You know, there's such grief in that experience, and yet that moment of remembering something about the person who's passed that was just so funny, right? Just that that joy of that person's life and how they touched me was so there, even in you know my in that that feeling of loss. So when we can allow all of our emotions to be fully expressed, we are little emotional processing machines. <laughs> and right. we tend to not allow ourselves to be that. Right. And so many people, I think, are under the misunderstanding that when they're emotionally healthy, they'll never feel lonely or anxious or depressed or any of these so-called negative emotions. But if you look at it, to me, the word emotion is supposed to be energy in motion. So when, when you feel something, you want to put it in into motion, right? Whether right. it's talking about it or singing about it or shouting about it or talking mm -hmm. to a friend 
or moving your body, right? You're processing it. By doing that, you're allowing the emotion to continue to flow. So instead of cutting it off and saying it's wrong or bad or I can't feel that or I don't want to feel that, instead you're allowing it to take shape. It's like what, what artists have done for you know um, thousands of years, right? Letting their emotions be put into the clay or the paint or the words and then rhythm and music. Right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I actually studied art history at Brown University. And I remember my professor who was the chairman of the art department, he said the best artists are what he called unshrunk. And so they're putting their energy, their passion and their emotions into the work and expressing mm -hmm. them. And that's mm -hmm. what we literally feel when we look at the painting. Right. Or we mm -hmm. listen to the music. So here we are in the coronavirus pandemic, and because of all the immense change that we're experiencing for people all around the world, I feel like it's bringing up a tremendous amount of emotion for us. Yes. So Unresolved you emotion, suppressed emotion that is being expressed, unfortunately, very negatively for a lot in, in this experience, but at least it's being expressed. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things, coronavirus affects your lungs. Of course, it affects your whole body, but the lungs, when you look at the lungs and what they're at a, about on an emotional level, the emotions are, the lungs are about, um, they're, they are about grief, they're about depression, they're about self-worth, right? So when your lung meridian is balanced, you're cheerful, um, you, you're humble before the beauty and wonderful of the universe. Lungs are also about prejudice. And what's interesting is that during the, so coincidentally, during this time of the pandemic, the, you know, we're re-examining racial prejudice, right? So this is a very long meridian time, in my opinion, right? What are your thoughts? about the emotions that are going on during the coronavirus pandemic, Peter Bedard? Well, I think, <laughs> I think that what, exactly what you're saying, that there has been so much suppressed resentment and anger. And I think that people haven't been allowed to express it. Either they weren't allowed to express it because it wasn't politically correct, where they weren't allowed to express it because if they did, they risked their life. Mm -hmm. And our, we've boxed people in, in so many horrific ways that people are gasping for air. And, and I mean that metaphorically and I mean that physically. And when you create that situation, I, I once had an experience where somebody I loved was panicking in the water and couldn't breathe. And he climbed on top of me, which is normal, right? In order, cause he couldn't breathe. So his instinctual experience was to shove me down in order for him to be able to like rise up and breathe, right? Wasn't anything that was done, you know, cruelly or, or anything like that. It was just the body trying to breathe. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor for our time that we have to stop shoving people down in order for us to be able to breathe. And we need to honor this. We need to allow that grief that has been ancestrally handed down generation after generation. I mean, as an LGBT man, I don't have the same racial experience but I've experienced so much abuse. I've had knives pointed at me, I've guns pointed at me, I've been surrounded by people trying to threaten to kill me. I've had horrific things said to me. And it takes your breath away. And it does like have a trauma effect of not being able to feel safe, to be able to breathe in where you go and how you live and what you do in life. And by by allowing myself to go like breath work i think is one of the most powerful things that i've seen people really do there's so many wonderful you know treatments out there are ways to heal but the breath 
I think as you're saying, right now in this moment is so important. And right. to allow people to breathe allows people to maybe sit back and be present with their emotions. Right. And this, you brought this up. And during the coronavirus pandemic, I've given away the Little Book of Breathwork, my book, to people in 13 different countries. And it includes a routine where you can cut your anxiety half in about eight minutes. It also includes uh, yoga mudras that you can use for different, um, to resolve different issues. And my favorite um, yoga mudra to let go of emotions that are bothering you is called mushti mudra. Now to do mushti mudra, you take your hands, and you bring your thumb in between your ring finger and your middle finger, and then you close the other fingers on top of it. And just by holding Mushti Mudra and breathing, again, sometimes we know what's bothering you. So sometimes we think, well, there's a pain in my hip. I don't really know what it's about yet, but I know it's there and it's bothering me. So by holding Mushti Mudra and setting your intention to let go of the emotions, that, and releasing that energy way down deep, you know, you can just be present and breathe through it, right? So, mm -hmm. right? And Yeah, I love it. I was, I was doing it while you were talking. It's wonderful. Right. And, you know, this is a process. So you would obviously do Mushti Mudra for a while. And if you're listening to this broadcast and you would like a copy of the Little Book of Breathwork, just send me an email, Catherine at KatherineKerrigan.com, and I'm sending you the ebook for free. Now, mm -hmm. the other thing, we're talking about emotions during the pandemic. And when we go into survival mode, mm -hmm. you go into either fight, flight, or freeze. So this pandemic has put a lot of people into survival mode because lots of people are afraid of literally losing their life or mm -hmm. millions of people have lost their job. Or even if they, you haven't lost your job, maybe your income has been reduced. So putting these things into fight, flight, or freeze. Now, when you go into the back of the brain, into the amygdala, you are just reacting. You're not accessing the frontal lobes of your brain where you're thinking logically. So the, so fight, flight, or freeze, all these survival mo emotions can be quite deep. And this is your rage, your panic, your fear, right? Mm -hmm. So a whole list of very intense emotions, but they literally shut you down. And from a physiological perspective, they lock up the back of your body. So this is going to show up as any pain in the back of your body, you know, from yeah. your calf muscles up. Now, Peter Bedard, you talk about communicating to your pain and listening to your pain. How do you, if, if someone's listening to this audience and they go, yeah, I've got this neck pain or hip pain or back pain, how do you recommend that we go about listening to the pain and communicating with it? So it's a very simple process, and most people are aware that the pain's communicating with them anyway. That, and that when I people always say to me after we go through this process, like, yeah, I knew I was supposed to do that, <laughs> or I've been thinking about that for years. Well, <laughs> all right. So one of the best ways is to actually just sort of become conscious of that. What are the things that you've been putting off? What are the things that you have been aware of that you haven't been doing? You know that you're supposed to do this. You were guided to do that. Your intuition has been telling you to, and you've been ignoring it, right? So just having those sort of conscious conversations with your friends, with family members, calling yourself out, maybe writing a few of them down, right? I know I was supposed to go plant that garden, and I did do it. Well, that is, that is part of your subconscious, your intuitive part, speaking to you, and saying this will bring you healing. You know, if we're if we're healing on the physical, mental, and spiritual level, I asked my my knee at one point because my knee was blown up. I, part of my story is that I shattered my knee, I cracked my vertebrae, I died, I was slammed into the back of a semi truck. And in healing my knee, I said, what does what does it need on that spiritual level? What does it need on that level of of nature, oneness, connection, universe, right? And I got this flash in my head of pulling weeds in my garden. Now my critical brain 
judge that as ridiculous and stupid and whatever, what a, what a dumb thing, right? But then after a while, I said, what am I, what do I got to lose? Just go, right? And I could only use one leg at that time because my knee was so blown up. I couldn't put any weight on it. So there I am hopping out in my garden. I got down on the ground, you know, my left leg is straight out to my side and I'm sitting kind of on my right leg, you know, and I'm on the ground and I'm pulling weeds and just cleaning up the yard, getting the leaves and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden I take a moment and I breathe and I realize I'm not in pain. I wasn't in pain. I had been in so much pain, excruciating pain. And by getting my hands dirty and listening to my knee and that request that was made on that spiritual level to go pull weeds that I judged is really dumb, I went and did it and I had a heal. That's, so, so, mm -hmm. that's such a profound story. And I, I, it, this begs another story that I have to share because it really expanded my view of what actually is healing. So years ago, I worked one-on-one -on -one with, I'll just say, a leading minister of a church in Atlanta. And I'll never forget, his secretary called me one day and he said, you know, this minister can't move his jaw. His jaw is locked up. He's in tremendous amount of pain. Do you think you can help him? So I went over to his home to do the healing and he couldn't talk, he couldn't move his jaw. His jaw was literally frozen. And I'll never forget figuring out what the issue was and what he needed to do to resolve it. Because he was someone who lived on church property and he had to be nice all the time. Imagine if you had to be nice all the time. Yeah. So, you know, and, and then he was supposed to be this holy man, but he was still a human. So anyway, the solution for him was that once a week, he needed to go to the gun range and shoot pistols and swear his head off because he didn't have a way of moving the energy of anger and frustration, right? Yeah. And so I was like, okay, so who would have thought that shooting guns and swearing would have been a healing activity? But by doing that, all the pain in his jaw went away and he was able to talk again, right? I actually encourage people all the time to go in your car, roll up the window, because anger is an actual physical thing in my understanding. It is something that can be handed from person to person to person. And it expands and it grows. And so I encourage people all the time to go in their car, roll up the windows and say all those things that you never would want to say to somebody in person. So use whatever foul language <laughs> you can. Yeah. Say the most cool thing. As long as those windows are rolled up and you're someplace where you're not going to pass it on. Get it out of you. But I wanted to just go back a little bit because people I think are, they love your show and I know people do listen. And, and I want to just give a little more advice on how to listen to the parts of you that are suffering. So I'm gonna just lay out a really quick little process and I've touched base on this already. But one of the first things is to invite the part that's in pain, again, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual, any kind of pain, invite it to come in and take on a shape and a form. Give it that so that the brain can start relating with it and it's not just blanketed by this overwhelming experience. So give it a name, give it a shape. It could be anything Accept the person that you're angry at if there's an actual person. It could be a historical figure. It could be a younger version of you, but it cannot be someone who's still alive. So it could be an, a, a shape, a geometry. It could be a, an outline of something. It could be a sense of nothingness. It could be a knife, whatever it is. Give it a name. Give it a shape. Then say I love you and thank you to it. Listen, just allow yourself just to be with the experience. I ask my clients to start observing the experience. What is actually the color of the pain, the shape of the pain, the texture of the pain? Instead of actually being in the experience of it, allow yourself to sit back and observe it through your senses. Because how we know stuff in our brain is through our senses. Whether we are consciousness, conscious of it or not, there is a color and a temperature and a texture and a sound and a smell and a taste that is associated 
with that understanding. So just start being aware. Then I start having a conversation with them and you can, it will communicate with you. Sometimes people get verbal communication. Sometimes they just get that blob gets bigger or it gets, it gets smaller, right? Sometimes it gets more agitated and angry and sometimes it gets more calm. Sometimes it's a thumbs up and a thumbs down. That's it, right? Okay? <laughs> However it wants to communicate, establish a form of communication with this part. Sometimes we have to even introduce ourselves to the part of us because we've been so alienated from it. And it sounds kind of silly to, you know, do that with, hi, me, <laughs> I've been so cruel to you. I'm not going to do that anymore, right? I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I'm going to be your friend now. And if my friend came to me and was in pain, I wouldn't punish my friend. I wouldn't shame them. I wouldn't make them wrong and bad. I would say, I'm so sorry. What can I do to help? Now, I might think I know the way to tell my knee to heal. And that's what we have to be careful of. Because uh, like I see this in, in like weight loss a lot, right? You have to diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. I'm gonna tell my, my brain is telling consciously that my body has to do this. Well, that's not necessarily the answer. It could be a answer, but maybe the, the, the body actually needs to feel loved or safe. And that weight is what's been feeling protected for it. So if I lose the weight, how am I going to be protected? So maybe I need to actually sit down with that part of me, my fat, and I need to say, hey, what's going to help you feel protected? What can I do to help you feel safe in the world? Right? And we ask these three questions to the part. We just ask the question. Sometimes people get answers. If you're anything like me, sometimes the answers take time. And so I need to ask the question and then it kind of just bounces around in my subconscious and I'll be doing something like showering or driving down the street and the answer pops into my head, right? So the three questions are, what can I do to help you heal physically? Mm -hmm. What can I do like, that's going to be a physical activity, right? Dancing, running, jumping, singing, doing something, whatever physical thing, exercise, whatever it is. What can a breath work? What can I do on that level of mind? in my thinking, because the way I think about my pain is not helping. It ended me up here. Can I think about something different? When those thoughts come in and I'm catastrophizing or I'm going into fear and judgment or worry, I'm projecting into the future, what can I think about? Maybe it's thinking about nothing like a lot of meditative practices. Maybe it's actually thinking about something like a chant or a mantra. Maybe it's watching silly cat videos and just laughing as much as you can, right? And just thinking about that instead of whatever you've been telling, the stories you've been telling. And that third question is on that level of spirit, on that level of nature, oneness. I'm not talking religion here. I'm talking about the energy, the spirit of the universe, the spirit of you, the life source, right? On that level of spirit, what can I do that's going to provide you healing? And I just allow myself to sit, whether I need to meditate on it, whether I ask the question and let it bounce around in my psyche, whether I actually have dialogue with somebody, whether I, I actually do a gestalt type of thing. And I sit here and then I go over there and I'm my pain and I'm talking from that point of view. Anything at all, however you want to do it, it's a very simple little process. And the three questions are, what can I do to help you heal physically? What can I do to help you heal mentally? What can I do to help you heal spiritually? And to do it all with love and kindness. When we learn to listen and communicate with ourselves in that way, with the parts of us that are suffering, then the healing, the doors get flown open and we get guided. People show up in our lives like you, right? Like we may say, I don't really know, but I need some help. And then all of a sudden somebody shows up like you and you get to work in that mental sort of spiritual way that medical intuitives do, right? It might be that you need to go to a nutritionist on that physical side and we get guided. It might be allopathic medicine is the way I do it. I just allow the part to do the guiding. And sometimes it doesn't actually happen very often, but sometimes that part says, you know, I need to do that surgery. And we honor that completely. You know, I say healing can be found, and this is not my saying, but I like to say this, the healing can be found in everything. Healing can be found in a medication. Healing can be found in a holistic or an integrative world. 
You know, everything is, 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 is available to us. And to actually allow the person and the part specifically to guide the healing process allows people to have so much confidence because they kind of get like a blueprint laid out. <laughs> you know, and these aren't, aren't single conversations. These are daily conversations sometimes. You know, that part should, just like the pain shows up, whenever the pain shows up, look, there's a need for a conversation. Absolutely. And a lot of us who have chronic pain need to be having these conversations with different parts of ourselves on a regular mm -hmm. basis. But I, I agree with you that when we bring the feeling and emotion of compassion to every situation and healing, then everything shifts, right? Absolutely, absolutely, Catherine. And this has to do with our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with our body and our relationship with the earth and the relationship with the world around us. Yes, and we're forgetting that. That's why I wanted to come and talk about that. What is this moment in time teaching you? Mm. What do you need? What do you need to learn? from this moment individually and as you as part of a culture. What does the culture need to learn from you in this experience and what do inside, you know, as above, so below, right? Like that type of thing. It actually is very true. When we learn to do these skills on the inside, then we could actually learn to expand them into a societal way and just learn to listen. Very powerful message. You've been listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been the wonderful Peter Bedard, founder of Convergence Healing. You can find out more about Peter Bedard and his wonderful work at convergencehealing.com and convergencehealingtees.com. And remember, when you want to get rid of your pain, the first step is to listen to it. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.